Meet the church. There was a day and age for that anthem to ring loud and true. It is certainly this day and this age which we need to be the church. Amen. Listen, I'm so excited about this series we've been doing. This is the final one, though, in the series of messages on the end times. And more than dealing with the prophetic signs of the times, we've been talking about specifically some of those prophetic signs in regard to the culture of the last days, more specifically about our own lives. We dealt with part one and two, talking about the generation of the end times. And we talked about from 2 Timothy chapter 3, about 19 character traits for the end times. After that, we dealt with, uh, you can come on in, please. Find a seat, ma'am. Y'all help the lady at the back find a seat, would you? <laughs> then we dealt with my heart in the end times. It's my wife for those who are not sure, all right? So <laughs> After that, we dealt with uh, my home. Last week, I think it was a very important message. If you were not here for whatever reason last week, if you have a family, all right, you need to get that message, all right? Download it, whatever, look it up on YouTube, order it. But that's a, a critical message about the importance of teaching the certain principles in our home, with our families, and, and how we do that. And the most important things we need to be teaching our children in this generation. So we'll get that. And this last one has to do with the end times and, and my church, all right? And what it means to be the church in the last days. This is part five in the series. And I want to get real honest with you today, folks. We're not talking about the church down the street. We're talking about our church. I'm a member here at Believers Fellowship, just as you are. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking to us today, all right? To us people that are here, that are part of this church. We call ourselves a member or a tender of Believers Fellowship. This message isn't for someone down the street, although it would do well to play at many churches. It is for us. And so I want you to kind of get a hold of that as we talk about the last days. We've talked about our hearts and our homes. And now we want to talk about our church. Now, I think a great place to go in scriptures, we're dealing with the church in the last days, is uh, to the book of Revelation, the book dealing with the last days. In the book of Revelation, the first chapters deal with Jesus speaking through the apostle to give messages to certain churches. Seven churches are in that list. Now, those churches were real churches during the time and during the day, had real issues that the Lord wanted to speak to them about. But there are many conservative theologians today and through years past who have believed that those same seven churches also held great prophetic significance to the last days and that each of those churches were dealt with a certain time or generation or culture of the church age from the resurrection of Jesus up to the present day. The last in that seven in the list deals with the church of Laodicea. That church there is the last in the mentioning of churches that near the Colossae. It was a real church in a real time and a real place. But the message that the Lord spoke to them not only was for that generation, but I believe it had prophetic significance for the last church, the generation that would be alive prior, right before the Lord returns, the end of the end of days, the last of the last of days. And so the church of Laodicea holds very important significance for us today. And we need to pay close attention to what it says. All right, so let me just give you a little background on Laodicea first of all. It was a very, very, very wealthy city. It was founded by Antiochus II, and it was named after his wife, Laodicea. His wife's name was Laodice. And it was strategically located in a place where it became, because of its location, the center pretty much of, of, of much of the wealth uh, in the world at that time. There were three major sections or highways that coursed through Laodicea, which made it a center of uh, a commercial banking. It made it a center for, for industry. It was known really for three specific things in that regard. And by the way, it is always interesting if you, when you study the world, to look at some background research on where you're at in the, in the word because the Lord so uniquely deals and, and brings everything into picture if you look at the whole story. In Laodicea, they were known for their banking, all right? There was a center of great wealth. A lot of gold went through Laodicea. They were also known for the manufacture of a very special blend of wool. It was called black wool. And it came off black sheep, but it was very, very prized. And that was the place that was the center for the, 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 the industry for them. It was also had a medical school there. And out of that medical school was also a pharmacological kind of institution. And they, they developed a specific eye during the day to help people with, with blindness and with visual problems. So it was known for those three things. If you're familiar with the passage, you know that those are some of the things that Jesus spoke to them about, their, their gold and their wealth and their, and their garments, and he talked to them about their eyes. So again, there's nothing coincidental in the Word of God. I always call it God-incidental. 
But there's another thing that we'll deal with about Laodicea. They had to pipe their water in because the water in Laodicea was nasty. In fact, it caused most people to throw up. It was a kind of a, it was a, it was a stagnant kind of water and it wasn't, you know, wasn't fit to drink. So they had aquifers like many of the Roman cities and they brought the water in via aquifer. So we'll talk a little bit about that because it's relevant to the passage today. But let's look in Revelation chapter three with a little background like that and see what the Lord says to this church. To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this. Now that's the Lord Jesus speaking, all right? I know your deeds. You're neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. He goes on to verse seven, because you say, I am rich and I become wealthy. I have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich and white garments that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Verse 19, to those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. I will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So you see, there's a lot of significance about where this location was and to the things that the Lord brought to their attention and how he used what was relevant around them to bring a very clear picture of something that was not so relevant. That was their spiritual condition. So he talks to them about the, this gold and he talks to them about their eyes and he talks to them about their, their garments. But the, the heart of this message to the church, I believe is this issue of a sin that was so bad, so horrible in God's sight, in the Lord Jesus' sight, that he says, this makes me want to throw up. This is what sickens me. This is what I have trouble. Now, it's, he doesn't deal with them about homosexuality. He doesn't deal with them about adultery. It's not a message on stealing. It's not a message on lying or idolatry. The heart of the message is dealing with the complacency and the lukewarmness of the church itself, his people. Those whom I love, that's who I rebuke. That's who I chasten. So this morning, as we look at this, I ask you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to take this passage and see if there's any way it even sim similarly or familiarly corresponds with your walk and your life at this particular time. I will tell you right off the bat, this is not a uh, make Pastor Joe popular sermon. This is not let's give Pastor Joe a raise sermon. All right. This is the voice of the Lord speaking from the word of God to I, what I believe is the last day's church to what I firmly believe with all my heart is us. We are that church and we are that generation. Now, the, it, again, the heart of this message deals with just the lukewarmness of this particular church. And there's three things he does in introducing. First of all, he says, you know, and he talks about himself here. This is Christ speaking. John is making it very clear. This message for us comes from the Lord. He says, he is the amen. He's the faithful and true witness. He's the beginning of the creation of God. Says to you. In other words, here's what Jesus says. And I love the titles again, the amen. It just deals that he's, he's the confirmation. Amen is a terminology of confirmation. When somebody says something, we heartily believe it. We usually say, amen. Jesus says, I am the confirmation. I am the amen. I am the one who confirms all things. I'm the one who confirms the promises of God. I'm the one who confirms the promises of God in your life. He is the amen of all that God says. But he also, he's, he's not only this, this confirming Christ, he's also the convicting Christ. He calls himself, I am the faithful and the true witness. What is he saying? He's saying, anything I'm about to tell you about you is true. <laughs> All right. I am the faithful and the true witness. I haven't got any reason to lie to you. Why? Because he is truth. There's no lie in him. There's no dishonesty. There's no self-motivation here. He's just saying, here's the facts. I am the faithful and the true witness. In other words, 
I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not going to dilute the truth. I'm not going to try to make the truth palatable by distorting the truth. I'm going to testify and my testimony will just be the truth. So when the Lord testifies, even on your behalf or my behalf, it's always the truth. All right. And we live in a world that doesn't really want to deal with truth, by the way. We want a little bit of the truth, but not the whole truth and nothing but the truth. The third thing he says about himself, he talks about the controlling Christ. He calls himself the beginning of the creation of God. In fact, he is the beginning of the creation of God. All things were made by him, the scripture tells us, and without him was not anything made that was made. All things come from him, all things go through him, all things go ultimately to him, the scripture tells us. So he is, in very clear picture, the Lord of glory. So everything he says here is absolutely important. We need to pay attention. We don't need to read it like we're looking at maybe a quick morning devotional or something, so we can check something off our spiritual list for the day. He said, hey, this is the message. And then he starts talking about this lukewarmness. And I want to deal with, first of all, in regard to this, the, the curse of lukewarmness, all right? He says, you know, you're too cold you know, to be hot and you're too hot to be cold. You fall right in the center of all things. And this really does, it, it speaks of complacency. It speaks of a lack of commitment, you know? He says, this lack of commitment in your life, this complacency in your spiritual life is making me sick. Who's speaking here again? This is the Lord Jesus, all right? He says, you're not hot, you're not cold. I would that you were cold or hot. Now, he's, now please understand when he talks about hot and cold here, he's not talking about a cold Christian. That's the way a lot of people interpret this. Or an on fire Christian is a hot Christian. Let me give you a little bit of history, just a little bit more behind the, the history of Laodicea. Because the water was bad, as I said, they had to bring the water in by aquifers. They brought it in from two places, Colossae to the south, which had really cold springs, or they brought it from Heropolis from the north, which had really hot springs. Hot springs are good. Cold springs are great. Hot springs, people go to hot springs even in Arkansas for medicinal purposes, for relaxation, for, 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 for help. You know, there, there's a purpose for hot water. All right? And there's a great purpose for cold water. But the problem was by the time they got the water from those two locations, 10 to 15 miles apart, it came into the city, not hot and not cold, but what? You guessed it. In other words, there's, there's no purpose. Jesus said, he's not saying I want you like a cold Christian. That never is God going to confirm that in your life. All right. He wants you being an on fire Christian, but he's talking about in the context of purpose here. You know, what, what purpose? You're, you're not healing. You're not refreshing. You're not anything. It's like the salt. When he says, Jesus said, the salt has lost its savor. It's good for nothing to be cast out and, and trod, trodden underfoot of men. It's good for, for what? For nothing. He said, now that's the same idea, this lukewarm mindset and this lukewarm water. It's, it's good for nothing. So he, he's talking about this half-hearted, this complacent believer. He's a good person. But he's, as, as Matthew 5 says, he's good for what? He's good for nothing. And we're living in a culture where most of the people, especially in church, they want to be good people. All right, we want to be good people, but not too good. <laughs> don't be too good. Leave me a little room for, you know, my, whatever I like to do. But don't, don't require me that, that sacrificial mindset of, of living my life all out for the Lord. I mean, because that would be something else. As I was studying for this, I, I did read a, a couple of sermons from other pastors because I always do that. After I'm, usually the first thing I do in the process of my studying, I, I, I take the passage, I begin to memorize the passage, begin to meditate on the passage, begin to just make some rough notes with a pencil and a pen and, and score it all out. And then after I've done that and done a little more meditation and prayer, then I'll start referring to, you know, commentaries and dictionaries and word studies for different, different, uh, different words within the passage, a little more meat. And the last thing I usually just kind of top it all off as I'll read some other, some other authors and some other writers on, on that particular topic. But I couldn't pass this up. There was, there was one author, and I can't, didn't even write his name down, so I'm not doing him much service, but he did me a service by giving this to me. But he, put, he, he, gave, he said, there's six ways which the church today is showing their complacency. And I don't have them on the screen, but let's give them to you to re real quickly. Uh, see if you can handle them, all right? And they're all alliterated. They begin with S's, and I love alliterations because I'm so illiterate. Some, some of y'all get that in a minute. But anyway... He says, the first thing that you, you that mani that how you can tell if lukewarmness is being manifested in your spiritual life, he says, one is some are just lukewarm about sanctification. That means they're lukewarm about their growth and their maturity in Christ. They're not really committed to growing in the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they're somewhere in their life, they've settled down, they've compromised with the world. They're not all that bad, they're just not all that good, all right? They don't steal. 
He goes on to say they, they, they don't cheat maybe on their taxes. They don't commit adultery, but they watch it for entertainment. You know, they don't tell big lies. They just tell half truths. They, they don't curse. They just use a lot of impure language about other people. They're not all that bad. They're not all, they're not all that excited about purity and holiness either. The second thing he talked about was some are just lukewarm about their service. I thought this was good. He said, they take lightly their commitment to Christ. They take lightly their commitment to their church. And they said, this involves the people that are in the church. He said, I'm talking about teachers, leaders, pastors, musicians, ministry leaders. You know, they're in there and they're doing a pretty fair job, but they're not really, they're, they're just complacent and they're lukewarm. I heard an illustration the other day. He said, the average church, they, here, here's the description this pastor gave. He says, it's, it's a mild-mannered man standing before mild-mannered people, exhorting them to be more mild-mannered. <laughs> That's, that's the picture of many today. He said, they're not excited about sanctification. They're not excited about their service. Oh, they're going it, they're doing it, they're doing it, but there's the excitement, the fervor's gone. And he said, they're lukewarm about the scriptures. He said, we do not love it. We do not read it. And that's pretty much where the church is today. Every Sunday you will find somewhere, if you go back and listen to every sermon I've preached to you in the 20 some odd years I've been preaching to you, you will hear me say once again, read your Bible, read the word. Memorize the word, study the word. Why? Because it's so relevant to everything we are as believers. He says, we believe the, here's what his point was. We believe the Bible generally, but not specifically. Say, what do you mean? Let me ask you, how many of y'all read, read the news? How many of y'all watch the news on TV? How many of y'all believe everything you see on TV about the news? How many of you believe everything you read in the news? That's this. How many of you believe everything on the internet? How many of you believe everything in the Bible? But compared to watching the news, reading the news, and being on the internet, how much time do you spend in the Bible versus that? Lukewarm. Lukewarm is, is what that falls under the category of being lukewarm about the scriptures. Number four, he said, some are lukewarm about supplication. When, when was the last time you really prayed, really prayed for the lost? When was the last time you really missed a meal so you could pray? When was the last time you gave up some time or even gave up sleep to pray? He went on to say this, that Satan will laugh at us because we do everything but pray. Because that's where the battle really is. But I want you to know Satan trembles and hell trembles when the church is fervent in their spiritual walk and in their spiritual life in regard to prayer. He goes on, number five, he says, some are just lukewarm about their sacrifice. He said, we're called to sacrifice our all to God. Here was his comment, but most church members do not love God enough to even give him a dime out of a dollar. Complacent, lukewarm. His sixth point was this. I know you're glad for I'm wrapping up his stuff. <laughs> Some are lukewarm about soul winning. But this is, this is what really this passage, I think, really boils down to. Purpose, you know, there's no purpose for this lukewarm water. It doesn't provide any refreshment. It doesn't re provide any restoration, any healing, any comfort. It's just lukewarm water. He said, so there's, there's, you don't have that sense of satisfaction. You, you, you know, we, we go through the motions. It's like we pray without earnestness. We, we pray without fasting. We, we give without sacrifice. We, we witness if we do without weeping and brokenness. It's no wonder that we're not, we're not, we're not reaping because we're not sowing. I was given an article this week, Southern Baptist Convention's having their big convention, largest denomination in the world, which we're a part of that denomination, and they're having a big conference. But they will report when they stand up at the reporting time for the convention this year, and they will say something like this. For the sixth or seventh year in a row, the Southern Baptist churches are diminishing in size and growth and baptizing fewer people than we ever have in history. They'll say something like this. We've lost 250,000 members this year in the church. Why is that? I think that's because we've become the Laodicean church. We've settled in. We're comfortable where we are. We've gone far enough to make ourselves happy, but we hadn't gone far enough to be refreshing and, and change, life changing to the culture around us. You say, what's so bad about lukewarmness? Well, I, I, Jesus says here, I'd rather have you cold than lukewarm. I'd rather have you hot than lukewarm. Uh, I'm not a big fan on the Message Bible. I, if you read it for a devotional, that's about all you'll get out of it. But, you know, it does make some good, good translations occasionally. It's supposed to be in the most modern English terms. But it says this in the Message. Here's that passage. It says, I know you inside and out, and I find little to my liking. You're not cold. You're not hot. Far better to be either cold or hot. You're stale. You're stagnant. And you make me want to vomit. Those are powerful words, no matter what translation you give to them, they're still the same. 
It was G. Campbell Morgan who said this, it is the worst, lukewarmness is, it is the worst form of blasphemy. It is a yawn in the face of God. It is an insult to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a city situated to change the world. And they're not doing that. A church in the right place at the right time, not fulfilling the purposes of God. And the Lord says, I'm about to spew you out of my mouth because of your attitude and because of your compromise. Lukewarmness. Let's look at the cause. I mean, how, how, how does the Laodicea get this way? How does the church get this way? I, I think there's a couple of things. One is just complacency. I think it's what comes clear. But it's a complacency that leads to deception. Because in verse 17, he says, you say, you say you're all right. You say we're rich and increased, we're good. And you say, you think they really were? Yeah, that, they probably were. They were probably all doing very well. It was, you know, it was the right place. The right, hey, if you're a real estate agent, you want to sell Laodicea. It's selling. Everybody wants to move there. All right. This is the place to be. And the church there is also reaping many of the benefits of what's happening commercially and industrial-wise in the community and in the city. They're in the right place. But they've been affected or infected by the worldliness that is there. This, this Laodicea, was, it was the up and coming. I mean, they had stadiums they built with all their money. They had all these tremendous water aquifers they were bringing in. They had entertainment centers. They had water worlds, all kinds of stuff like that. They were part of that culture. Sports were big. I mean, it sounds like America today when you look at the history of Laodicea. But the Lord visits them and says, I have much against you. And here's what I have against you. It is this complacency. You do not see your real need. And the biggest need they had at this point was to see their need and they wouldn't open their eyes. They were closed eyes and closed minded because they felt comfortable. So therefore we are all right. We're doing all right. It was their indifference rooted in their spiritual ignorance because they weren't in the word, because they weren't pursuing Christ. We just, it, it, it infects our life. When, you, when they would hear a sermon, perhaps like what I'm preaching to us today, they would be the first one to shake the preacher's hand on the way out and say, that was a great message. I wish those so-and-so had been here to hear that. Boy, he really needed that. When what we ought to say, that was the message I needed to hear today. That was the word I needed to have spoken to my day because I don't want to be this complacent person. I don't want to have this complacency that leads to this self-deception in my life. And there was also this issue of prosperity. You know, it, it also led to their deception. We get comfortable. You know, we get, we get drawn into thinking that what I need is this when what I need is a closer walk with thee, amen. And the Lord uses those issues. He talks about the gold. He talks about the asaph. He talks about the garments. And he talks about their real spiritual condition. But they were ignorant to the real spiritual the condition. And I believe the surrounding culture, much like what we are today, the surrounding culture has crept into the congregation and it paralyzes the spiritual life of the congregation. And we have to be on guard. We have to be cautious about letting this world and its system and its culture deceive us about our true spiritual condition. We, we don't need to have our own little personal checklist of what, what is right with God mean. We need to go to God and find out what right with God means. We need to be able to come to the Lord and say, Lord, search me. Check me out today. See if there's anything in my heart where I'm comp and wait around long enough to get the answer. A lot of people run to the altar, oh, Lord, search my heart. And then they're off 30 seconds later. Thank you, Jesus. Love you too. <laughs> Never spend time. I think sometimes we produce an atmosphere for that. But whatever the situation, they certainly misread what was going on. Jesus said to them, listen to these words, you don't realize you're wretched. That's a hard word. That's spoken many times of lost people. Why were they so wretched? Because they were supposed to be making the difference in the culture, and they weren't. That's wretched, he said. You're, you're, you're pitiful is the word he used. Pitiful and poor and blind and naked. You drive by that person just described on the street and say, what a mess he's in. Hey, look at that poor, wretched, pitiful, blind, lost person with no clothes on. But, he, you know, he just doesn't correct them, you know. And that's not what this message is about even today. It's not just about giving some, oh, well, you're just in bad shape. You need, you're, you're messed up. You're not where God wants you to be. You're there, you've become complacent in your life. And you're a Sunday school teacher. Or you're a lift creator. Or you're singing up here on the stage and you're complacent. I mean, you know, you're the preacher. and you're, you know, That's not what that's about. It's about, yes, to expose things that might not be right in our heart. But he, he said, listen, as many as I love, that's who I rebuke and that's who I chasten. 
Behold, I stand at the door and knock. In other words, you've pushed him out of fellowship. So what would be the cure? Well, he puts it pretty simple. One of my favorite Bible words is repent. Probably one of the use, least used words in the church in America today. Mentanai in the Greek language. Repent, change your mind. The way you perceive your life, the way you think about your situation, the way you think about your future, the way you think about your call, the way you think about your church, change your mind. Change your mind. Well, change it to what? That's a good question. Change it to his mind. It's, it's to change from something to something. Now, remember on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached the message on repentance? He said, they said, well, what must we do to be saved? And he said, repent. Change your mind. From what? Well, he just preached to them. He said, you guys crucified the Lord of glory. God raised him up from the dead and made him Lord. So change your mind from what? Wanting to get rid of him to making him Lord. Simply put. Change your mind from that to that. And what that is, is that Jesus is Lord. He says, repent and open the door. Open the door. I think it was a, a, the, the artist, there's uh, several pictures you can see in churches and different homes where, where Jesus is standing at the door. You've seen a lot of those. There's about five or six real popular pieces of art like that. Uh, one is uh, made by, I think his name is Holman Hunt. And when he did it, he's the one artist who put, when he showed the picture of Jesus at the door knocking, the doorknob is on the inside. <laughs> it's not on the outside. In other words, you have a decision you need to make. You can join me in this quest. You can be what I've called you to be. You can experience a higher kind of living that doesn't focus on self, but focuses on a, a higher form of life and living and, and expression of life that makes a difference in the world, or you can go on where you're at. I stand at the door and knock. If you hear it and you open it, I will come in. And he says, I will sup with you, all right? I will sup with it. Now, that's a good deal. When the Lord is supping with you, when the Lord is ultimately the context of setting down and sharing a meal together in fellowship. In other words, it is the Lord who says, I want to fellowship with you in your life on a daily basis so you make a difference in the world that you're living in. But you have to realize the handle's on the inside. You've got to open the door. You've got to make a decision here. There's this act you have to do. It's a definite act. It's a deliberate act. I'm knocking. Why is he knocking? Because he loves us. Because he has a purpose for us. Because there's a plan for us. So here comes the knock. What will you do when you hear the knock? Now, when we preach a message like this, and I, I believe with all my heart it's convicting. I've already been to the altar once this morning, all right? I got to the altar before I even preached it and then went again after I preached it. And we'll probably do it again today. It's a convicting message. But the, we don't need to be just kind of stirred with conviction. We need to hear what the message is saying and open the door. Let Christ take control. Let him be that faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation, the amen in our life. And do and follow and respond in fellowship to what he's telling us to do. It's not me doing something, well, let's see, I'm a Christian, so I need to pray today and read Bible. That's why I got my little checklist, I go up. That's not what this is about. It's not following the list of do's and don'ts. It's about saying, hey, I'm going to walk with God today. I'm going to experience his life. He tells me to speak, I'll speak. He tells me to shut up, I'm going to shut up. He tells me to go, I'll go. If he tells me to stay, I'll stay. I'm just, just going to make this day. Now, some people think, well, but you know, if, if I get all excited about Jesus like that, you know, then I just won't have time to work. You don't realize that when you really make this kind of surrender to Christ, it infuses your life so that you do work, so that you do raise a family, so that you are the parent you need to be, so that you are the young person you be. It just begins to affect everything you are for the glory of God. I'm still going to work, I'm still paying my bills. I'm still, you know, water in the yard when it needs it, all right? Whatever it might be, whatever my task or whatever my responsibility, but I'm, I'm doing it with a new motivation, with a new unction. I'm doing it for the glory of God. And now when I water my yard, my neighbor's watering his, guess what? He gets to hear a message, all right? He gets a little, little sermon with his sprinkler, <laughs> whatever it might be. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, it's not about me going to the grocery store, it's about me going to the grocery store so I can shine. So I can be used by God there. So I can discover what God's up to in my life and what he's doing in the world. But Jesus said, I've come to this last day's church and the last day's church is not ready for my coming. Every time you see in the scripture, these passages about prophecy, you always see those words, but wake up, be aware, be on guard, get ready. You know, these are the days, this is the hour. We're going to be caught like those scribes and Pharisees in Herod's palace. 
when Jesus comes. Remember the first time? Oh, they knew when he was going to come, where he was going to come, but they weren't interested in going, being part of it. I don't know about you. I know people are always looking for churches. Most people look for churches that aren't this convicting. But I need a church like this. I need pastors like this. I need Pastor Tim the way he is. I need you to be the way you are for the glory of God. Why? Because you and I, if we'll get honest, we have a tendency to get complacent real fast. It doesn't take us long to get complacent. We can do it in a matter of 24 hours or less. Moments sometime. Amen? You have a tendency to get lazy spiritually. I do. I need, I need to be around hot coals in the fire to keep my coals burning. I need a pastor who will get up. I need brothers and sisters who will get up and shake me and I can shake them and say, hey, are we living for Jesus today or being what God's called us to be? These are the last days, more important than ever before. We do what God wants us to do. We be sensitive about the call of God in our life, the gifts of God in our life, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It needs to be important to us again. Our call within the body of Christ needs to be important to us again. Jesus died for the church. Let's get on fire for Jesus. Let's be what God's called us to be. Y'all love doctors, right? Just as much as I need a pastor, you know, when, I, when I'm ill, I want a doctor that's excited about what he's doing, that comprehends what he's doing. I don't want to go to a doctor who hasn't opened a medical journal since he graduated. I don't want to go to a doctor who hadn't read the latest things on the internet regarding whatever his specialty is. If he hadn't done that, I'm not interested in going to him. I don't want to go to a doctor who's not curious to find out what's happening. I want to go to a doctor who's going to tell me the truth. I don't want to go to the doctor and you go in, you're sick as you can be, you're coughing, you're hacking, you're sore all over, and you walk in the doctor and finally get in to see him, you know, and he, he just kind of gives you a quick overall exam and says, okay, uh, pay the nurse on your way out. Excuse me, what's the matter with me? <laughs> I'm sick, I'm coughing, I got a fever, I don't feel good, I have no, I, come on, you're the doctor, tell me what's around. Don't worry about it, it's not a big deal. A lot of people are getting this. Well, what is it, bubonic plague? Hey, but don't worry about it. You're going to, everybody's going to die. Might as well be this as anything else. <laughs> I don't want a doctor like that, do you? Pay the nurse on your way out. That's not, that's not what you need, nor is it what I need. You know, I, I, want, to, I want somebody who's going to say, if there's a problem here, what is the problem? Because I want to, more than anything else in my life, to hear the Lord Jesus say, well done. I don't want him to say, <coughs> <coughs> you made me sick. You wasted your life. You were more interested in everything else. Oh, yeah, you went to church. You paid your little bit and all that. And you did all that stuff. You patted people back. You paid for some missionary. Good deal. But you personally were useless. You wouldn't speak up. You wouldn't pray up. You wouldn't give up. You just, you just wanted to do your thing. Listen. Don't assume anything. I'm going to ask you to do what I did the other campus today. I'm going to ask you to take some time before the Lord this week. All right? Not just as invitation. We'll give an invitation in just a moment. But I want you to do something beyond the invitation today. I'm going to ask you to commit yourself to spend some, some quality time with the Lord and be honest enough to open your Bible up and say, God, if this is me, it's not what I want in my life. I don't want to be that Christian. It makes you sick at your stomach. You died for me. You gave everything for me. There was no way in all of eternity that I would ever be saved from hell that I was bound to had it not been for you. I trust you. I've given you my heart and my life. I believe you. I need you to speak to me. And search me, O oh Lord. See where I'm at. Be specific with me, O oh Lord. Speak to my heart so that I might respond in the righteous way that you want me to respond and be what you've called me to be. I want to hear the door knocking so I can answer it. Because I don't want to miss what you have for me in my life. If that's radical, write me down as radical. I'd rather be radical than dead. 
I think that's what Jesus is saying. One guy put it better, wildfire better than no fire. Amen. Let's stand with our heads bowed.